Hi guys, uh, welcome to the last topic that we're going to look at this semester. So well done on making it this far. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is some applications of genetics to the field of medicine um, and what kind of things that we can uh, do to help out um, the medical community with genetics. So I want to start by explaining some of the genetic components of human diseases. Um, and basically, human genetic diseases come in two main types. The first are called monogenic diseases, monogenic single gene diseases, um, otherwise known as Mendelian diseases. And these are the kind of things that we've already looked at when we were discussing Mendelian genetics. In other words, we're looking at a single gene that when mutated can cause a single disease. Uh, and there are plenty of examples of these. There's some really famous ones, for example, Huntington's disease, which is actually a dominant mutation. Um, cystic fibrosis is a classic recessive mutation. So if two cystic, if, if two human beings that are heterozygous for the cystic for the gene that causes, or the mutation, I should say, that causes um, cystic fibrosis. If two heterozygote humans get together and have a kid, there's a one in four chance that their child will end up with both of the disease alleles of this gene and therefore carry the disease. So these are, you know, cases where one gene, one disease, very simple genetics. Um, there's a, there's, Thousands of known single gene disorders, most of them very, very rare. Some of them not so rare, like Huntington's and cystic fibrosis. But I would argue, and I think so would most geneticists, that most diseases are not this straightforward. And that's because most human diseases are polygenic in nature, or many gene diseases, polygenic diseases. Um, what, what these are, are genes where you carry um, some mutations in some genes, some number of genes that all contribute a little bit to a disease state. So polygenic diseases are complex and multifactorial. And basically, you know, you can imagine, so if we think about um, heart disease, for example, you could imagine that lots of genes play into heart health. If, you, if, if a few of those genes carry mutations that cause the proteins made by those genes to function slightly suboptimally, then you're probably fine if you carry a couple of those mutations. If you carry 10 of those mutations, so 10 genes that contribute to good heart health, say you have 10 genes that don't work quite that well, they're not completely uh, dead genes, they just have got some mutations that cause the proteins to, you know, work suboptimally. If you have enough of those mutations, then you cross some kind of functional threshold and run into a disease state. That is an example of a polygenic disease. Um, and a lot of diseases that people think of as well, they kind of run in families, polygenic diseases, where they sometimes skip a generation, those kinds of things. So polygenic diseases are very complicated. Um, they tend to exhibit reduced penetrance. So it's the mixture of alleles that you pick up from your parents that predispose you to a disease state. Um, and that's the key, is that most human diseases are polygenic and um, you are predisposed to a certain extent to get a disease. So there's one example of this. It's so one example of this is kind of well known, BRCA1, BRCA2, and a third gene, PALB2. Uh, these genes all can, um, mutations in these genes can lead to familial breast or ovarian cancer. Um, famously, Angelina Jolie underwent a double mastectomy because she carries mutations in, I can't remember which one of these genes now. Um, and she was predisposed to breast cancer. Um, with an 80% overall lifetime chance of getting that disease. And so proactively, she was completely cancer-free, 
she decided to undergo a double mastectomy because she felt that living with an 80% chance of getting the disease was, um, was not what she wanted to do. And more and more people are trying, uh, are taking that, that path. It's also important to note that this is a predisposition, right? It's not destiny. So even with these breast cancer genes that have an extremely high um, predictive power, it's still true that 20% of patients with these rare mutations show no cancer. So it's not like you get the mutation and you're 100% sure of getting a disease. That's a predisposition, right? Um, and some complex human diseases um, can be caused by um, different processes breaking down. So type 2 diabetes is a very common disease um, where you basically you, do, you have high blood sugar uh, because you don't respond, you don't take up sugar out of your blood quickly enough. And that phenotype, high blood sugar, can be caused by a bunch of different problems. Reduced beta cells in your pancreas, those are the cells that make insulin. Um, reduced production of insulin for some other reason. You can be insulin resistant. So insulin normally stimulates your cells to take up gl blood glucose. Those cells can stop responding to insulin. So you can have normal insulin levels, still have the disease. And there's other um, processes as well that can contribute to diabetes. And a lot of these processes, you know, can combine to take you over some threshold to give you the disease. In other words, if your insulin levels are kind of low and you're a little bit insulin resistant, either one of those by itself would not give you diabetes. Both of them together might do so. Um, the other thing when you think about complex human genetic diseases is that there are genetic and environmental risk factors that add to a disease. Um, and we're learning more about both of those all the time, both genetic and environmental risk factors. Um, and knowing these factors might help you change your lifestyle in order to, you know, um, not come down with a, with a particular disease. So when we're thinking about human genetic diseases and we want to find risk markers, in other words, mutations in your DNA that can somehow give you an idea of how much at risk you are for any given disease, um, how do we find those? So how do we find genetic risk markers um, and associate them with specific parts of your genome? There's basically two ways that scientists look for genetic variants that might be important in um, your, risk, uh, your risk factor for getting any given disease. One is the candidate gene approach and two, uh, something called genome-wide association studies. Um, and I'm going to just go through those one at a time and explain what's good and bad about each one of these approaches. The candidate gene approach uh, is sort of exactly what it sounds like. Um, the idea behind the candidate gene approach is that before you look for any DNA sequence that might be associated with a disease state, you think of where you want to look. So you have to have some biological process that you know a little bit about, pick some genes that you think might be involved in that biological process, and then look for um, DNA sequence that is associated with people that have a given disease. Uh, and this is powerful because any results that you get um, make sense, so that's great. And then, but then the disadvantages of this is that you've got to pick candidate genes to sequence. So um, you have to know something. And if you don't find anything, then you just didn't look at the right place. Here's a good example, alcoholism. Um, alcoholism and addiction in general um, are known to run in families. Um, when people started thinking about a genetic approach to studying alcoholism, there was a couple of logical choices in the human genome. Two genes, alcohol dehydrogenase, aldehyde dehydrogenase. These two genes are involved in metabolism of alcohol. So it seemed like a reason, these seem like reasonable candidates to sequence. 
Um, and indeed, when they were sequenced in individuals that both had a disease and individuals that didn't have the disease of alcoholism, uh, they found some mutations that were linked to alcoholism within those genes. So that's good. Um, an analogy for the candidate gene approach is basically this man who's looking for his keys in a parking lot. Um, and he's only looking under the light, right? Because that's the only place he knows to look. That's the candidate gene approach. And unfortunately for him, he is not um, going to find his keys because they're all the way over here, um, not under the light. So that's the restrictions of the candidate gene approach. So let's look at uh, the second way that scientists look for genetic risk markers. This is called the genome-wide association study approach. Um, and essentially this takes the sort of kitchen sink approach to looking for genetic risk um, in the human genome. And what it does is it takes all known genetic variants in the human population and look at a group of people that have a disease and a group of people that don't and see if there's any genetic variants that are more common in the disease group. Um, this approach normally focuses on things that are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, SNPs for short, um, and I'll explain what they are in just a second. The advantage of this is that it assumes no knowledge of any biological process at all. We're just looking at human genetic variation. Uh, and that's an advantage, right? We'll, we're looking everywhere. So if there's something there, we should find it. The flip side to that is we might not understand why mu any mutations that we find are associated with a given disease. And that's not so much a problem if all you want to do is predict whether or not you're going to get a disease. But that is a problem if you want to somehow figure out ways to treat that disease. So um, let's just examine what polymorphisms and SNPs are so that you can understand how genome-wide association studies are performed. Um, basically, you take my DNA and your DNA. We're very, very similar. The number's actually higher than that. It's like 99.9% .9 identical. Um, and polymorphisms is the catch-all term for any DNA sequence that's different between two individuals. Um, as you guys know, 98% of the human genome is, oh, one of my kids is injured. Everyone's fine, don't worry. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so as you guys know, only 2% of the human genome encodes for um, protein coding genes. 98% of your DNA does not. So most polymorphisms, just by, you know, the fact, just by virtue of the fact that 98% of your genome are not protein coding genes, most polymorphisms fall in that category um, of your DNA, which makes them difficult to interpret. Uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, is essentially just what it sounds like. It's a polymorphism that's a single base. And so here's an example of a SNP. Here's your DNA and my DNA. They differ at a single point. You have a G, I have an A. Um, and what has been kind of clear, although not as clear as people would have liked um, at the start of this whole process, um, but what is kind of clear is that some SNPs can be predictive of certain ph phenotypes, like how well you're gonna to respond to any given drug or what risk you are of getting any given disease. Um, there's about 14 million SNPs in the human genome. Um, and the idea of using them to track predisposition to a disease is pretty simple. Um, you sequence a whole bunch of people. Here's an example of a SNP where some people have a G and some people have an A, um, green people and red people. Um, you take the normal population and, the samp and a sample of people that have a disease, and you see if there's an overrepresentation of any given SNP 
in the people with the disease. So here you can see there are more green people in the cohort of people that have the disease. That means that G, that variation, that SNP, is associated with whatever disease we're talking about. So the logic's pretty simple. 14 million SNPs in the human genome, you sequence them all, and you see if any of them are more prevalent in people that have any given disease. And the idea behind this, right, is now we're gonna find the keys easier because we've turned every light on in the parking lot. Um, that's the idea behind these kind of studies. Um, one thing that we haven't really talked about yet, but I think is worth mentioning, is why uh, all of this human genetic stuff is possible now, such as doing genome-wide association studies. Um, this is a graph that shows you how much it costs to sequence a, ge a human genome. Um, so way back when the first human genome was sequenced, it cost about $100 million to sequence that human genome. Uh, and then cost of sequencing genomes was going down throughout the early 2000s, um, roughly at the same rate um, as predicted by Moore's law. And Moore's law is basically um, the speed at which computing power gets better over time. Uh, and you can see that as computing power increased, so um, did the decrease in um, sequencing the human genome. And then in about 2007, um, uh, there was a complete revolution in DNA sequencing technologies, which basically caused the cost of sequencing to drop off a cliff. And now it costs around $1,000 to sequence a genome, which is crazy cheap. Because sequencing is so cheap and easy to do now, it makes doing genome-wide association studies way easier. Um, and as you can see in 2007, which is roughly when the next generation sequencing technology began, all of a sudden people started to do way more of these studies. Um, years are along the bottom here, number of genome-wide association study publications are on the left. Um, and you can see they were going up rapidly over time and now um, there's about four and a half thousand publications looking at different diseases um, using this um, technology to sequence all of human vari genetic variation and see if it tracks with the disease. Um, here's a slide that shows you human chromosomes um, and the colored dots that you can see kind of painted on those chromosomes are places where SNPs have been found that are associated with certain diseases. So as you can see, it covers every chromosome basically in the genome. If we zoom in on a chromosome, here's number 17, uh, just so you can read what's going on, you see that there are a bunch of different SNPs that are associated with a whole bunch of different diseases um, along this chromosome. Uh, because of this approach, we now know risk factors for many common diseases, certain cancers, asthma, stroke, obesity, lots of different things. Um, most of the genes that have been identified would not have been found using um, a candidate gene approach because the genes that they were associated with were a complete surprise. Um, it's also true, which is not a surprise, that a lot of these risk alleles are not in protein coding regions, which is confusing for geneticists because who knows what's going on? Maybe you're mutating an enhancer, right? Or a promoter or something like that. Um, and that's why you're causing problems um, phenotypically for the individual. Um, it also appears that most risk alleles don't, are not really very, very predictive. So most risk alleles increase the risk of your disease from by 10 to 40 percent, uh, which suggests what we kind of already knew, which is most diseases are in fact polygenic and you need to carry multiple risk alleles to actually get the disease. Um, one interesting thing that came out of this whole stuff is that a single change in your DNA can actually be predictive for several different diseases. So there's a single SNP associated with type 1 diabetes, 
rheumatoid arth arthritis and Crohn's disease. What does this suggest? This suggests that a single gene, when you mess around with it, might contribute to all of those diseases, which might lead to a revision in how some of these diseases are classified. So um, how much genetic risk is there for most diseases? Well, um, you know, we don't really know the answer to that, but we think that around 50% of the risk of any disease is thought to be due to genes. Um, the rest is probably due to environmental risk factors. Uh, and as far as we can estimate, we've discovered less than 10% of that hereditary component, which is a little disappointing. We hoped that we would be able to do more with these kind of genome-wide association studies. In order to up that number and start to understand a little better how um, genetic sequence contributes to human disease, we need more sequence for more people to cut out the noise and up the signal and figure out what genetic changes do. And that is going to happen because people are getting their DNA sequenced at an unprecedented rate right now. Um, so hopefully that's true. Okay, I'm going to end there for this first part. In the second part, we're going to talk about um, some a specific example of genetic um, risk, and then we'll talk about some of the newer techniques that we are using to combat disease using genetics. I will see you for that.